Bienvenidas, bienvenidos. Es un placer recibirlos en ya prácticamente el cierre de esta Feria Internacional del Libro Monterrey. Eh, para la Cátedra Alfonso Reyes y para la Feria, es un enorme placer recibirles y de manera especial recibir al profesor investigador Jen Bendel. Jen Bendel es profesor emérito de la Universidad de Cumbria en la United Kingdom, eh, estudió en la Universidad de Cambridge y durante muchos años fue asesor de finanzas y de empresas en materia de sostenibilidad. Hoy Jem vive en Bali, en Indonesia, donde tiene un proyecto de sostenibilidad y desde donde, desde donde se generó su nuevo libro. Es reconocido en los ambientes académicos por su texto Deep Adaptation, Adaptación Profunda, en el cual hace un replanteamiento de un nuevo paradigma para comprender las crisis, prácticamente los colapsos ambientales, sociales, económicos en los que estamos. Y a partir de Deep Adaptation se genera su nuevo libro, Breaking Together, a Freedom Loving Response to Collapse, donde nos habla sobre cómo pensar y vivir, sobre todo en tiempos de colapso. Para el Tecnológico de Monterrey es motivo de una profunda satisfacción presentar la edición en español de su libro que hemos traducido al español como Cayendo Juntos. Eh, es una coedición entre el Tecnológico de Monterrey y Nola Editores. Vamos a estar conversando el día de hoy con Jem, él dará primero una presentación y luego tendrá una conversación con el doctor Luis Fernández, quien es el gerente académico de sostenibilidad del Tecnológico de Monterrey y a quien agradecemos profundamente el contacto con Jem, su lectura. Muchísimas gracias. Welcome to Monterrey, Jem. So you, you have your headsets um, for the translation? You do? Okay, good. Because um, Buenas Tardes is going to be my only Spanish for the next 20 minutes. So yeah, I am pleased to have reached you here in Monterrey. Uh, at the end of your festival. I think it was probably quite a good idea of the organizers to keep me back into the, to the end so that I didn't spoil the mood of the rest of uh, your book fair. Because what I'm going to talk about is not very fun. Um, in fact, I don't talk about it in public very much because of that. But I really wanted to come to Mexico when I was invited because I think that Latin America, more generally, could have a significant role to play in the coming years in the softening of the collapse of modern societies around the world. And I think three different areas of wisdom and of struggle that are known in, um, in Latin America in particular could help. And that's liberation theology, anti-imperialism, and indigenous wisdom, indigenous cultures. So I'm really honored to be invited to come and add some of my ideas into the uh, rich intellectual mix you have here in Latin America. I'm told for over 30 years, this book fair has showcased uh, ideas in the Spanish language, both fiction and non-fiction. And I still think that's a valid distinction, yes? Um, I saw a, a, a sign in a bookshop once that they had moved their books on apocalyptic fiction into the, the current affairs section. And um, who knows, in the coming years, they might do the opposite and move the current affairs book into apocalyptic fiction. But um, books, 
Books are a symbol and books are a reminder that we are a storytelling species. You know, so maybe whales and dolphins are communicating under the sea amazing myths to each other, but we, they don't build settlements based on their stories. And they don't seem to create their life purpose around stories. They probably don't kill each other based on their stories. This is something to do with us as, as humans. And uh, the philosophy of Buddhism has taught me more clearly than anything that we let um, stories repackage our experiences. It's also taught me that our desire, our desires to be safe, accepted, and comforted, and plus our aversion to anything that doesn't help with that, influences much of that labeling of experience. And of course, that can become problematic. In fact, it's at the heart of the mess we're now in as a species. When we refuse to see or hear or accept aspects of our reality that we don't enjoy, it's what psychologists call denial or disavowal. And of course, we do this all the time at so many different levels. So it was a year ago that I noticed one evening my cat, my beloved cat, was extremely tired, more tired than normal. And in the morning, the same, really tired. But I was going away for the weekend. I didn't want to be delayed. I didn't want to put him through the stress of going to the vets. So I, I didn't really let it sink in what I was noticing. And so I never saw him again when I came back that weekend. And so there's so much of sort of like we don't want to pay attention perhaps because we're afraid of what we might find, and we just hope it will go away. So it's not just Buddhists, but also, also psychologists who tell us that we deceive ourselves to avoid difficult emotions and distract ourselves from them. And we also do it to fit in and get along. Self-deception can serve us by helping us to conform and succeed within society as we find it. But of course, it doesn't help us when things in that society are going very wrong, such as when societies are beginning to break down, which is what I believe the situation is today. So since the mid-1990s, I've worked on environmental issues in various roles at the UN, in the private sector, in NGOs, in politics, and then finally, as you heard, as a full professor of sustainability. And I used to be proud of the successes that we had in moving the corporate sustainability agenda forwards. But also during that time, everything in the biosphere got worse. I'm 50 years old. In my lifetime, uh, wild animals have declined an average of 68%. Um, and the rest, uh, so now we've only got 4% of all mammals on Earth um, being something, um, sorry, 4% of mammals on Earth are wild. The rest is us, our pets, and our livestock. So that's a lot of um, wonderful humans, beautiful cats, but it shows you how much distortion and destruction has already occurred just in 50 years. And you know, you're at a book festival, you're at a book festival, so you, you like ideas, you like thinking. So you've probably heard about environmental issues and problems well before some of the famous billionaires have done. So you've probably heard of climate change well before Al Gore or Bill Gates. Maybe you know then that after 40 years of the science being clear, and the warnings being made that um, we're in an age of consequences now. 
Or maybe you just learned of it recently, maybe from your new president, Claudia Schoenbaum. Or maybe it's just because you've seen the changes that are happening in the weather just in the last few years, both here but also through the news. Sadly, globally, climate is changing faster than it was predicted and with more immediate impacts on forests, soils, oceans, and agriculture. Just over the last 12 months, we've seen 1.64 degrees Celsius global average temperatures above um, 130 years ago. 130 years ago is about 13.8 Celsius globally. So that's night and day, over sea, over land, north, south, just averaged. And now we're 1.64 degrees Celsius above that just in the last 12 months, um, if, we, if we add those 12 months together and compare. Now, that can all sound kind of technical, not that much about something out there, but that's an indicator of an incredibly rapid change in our environment. And farmers are already experiencing more difficulty from the weird weather associated with those changes. And so experts in food security believe that we're going to see disruption to grain markets just in a few years because of that. And whatever the rhetoric on this issue being taken seriously, finally, atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases continue to rise along with human emissions. But it's more worrying than that. The rate of sea level rise is an indicator of the whole system changing. Sea level rise rises because either the water is expanding as it gets warmer, or more water is melting on land and going into the sea. So that's, these are why we see sea level rise globally. Six years ago, I noticed satellite measurements suggested that this rate of rise was increasing. So not just sea level rise increasing, but the rate increasing. It was accelerating. So don't think about damage from sea level rise. Think about what that's telling us about changes in the whole system, the climate system, increasing, accelerating. And so what that means is that the warming processes may now be self-amplifying because of all the various feedbacks, which may mean that anything we do now might be minimal in what it can actually do to change future temperatures. So sadly, we are living in an age of consequences and it's going to get worse. And all this damage to the biosphere translates, as I said, into problems for things like agriculture. In Mexico in the last few years, you've had about 6%. We've had high food inflation, about 6% in the past year, and, um, which is the highest of o any OECD country, I found. And you have a, a I don't know what the, how you say it in Spanish, but it's the Mexican Institute of Finance and e Executives have published a document where they said that Extreme weather is a partial contributor to that food price inflation over the last few years. So what we're seeing is disruption globally because of environmental change. And data on quality of life shows a global plateauing since 2016 in 90% of countries. In fact, 90% of countries now, according to the Numbio Index, have a declining quality of life. And Mexico is actually unusual in not being one of them. Um, and I think that could be because more work has been done in Mexico in the last 10 years on reducing poverty. But the global phenomenon I've described means that we can't blame just one bad politician or one war or too many migrants or a nation losing its confidence or us not being religious enough 
or too much gender fluidity, or maybe we're not having enough kids, or there's some kind of evil deep state cabal running everything. You can't, you can't point to these kind of stories. This is a global phenomenon that's been happening for at least eight years. It indicates something fundamental biophysically is happening. And in my book, translated now as um, Cayendo Juntos, I'm connecting the cracks on the surface of modern life with crumbling foundations in our economic energy, environment, and food systems. And I conclude that we've reached a point where most modern societies, while continuing to function on the surface, are now already in their early stages of collapse. Now, this might sound a bit gloomy. And you know, I had a great lunch. I hope you did too. And maybe you're looking forward to a nice evening. Um, we're here, we're having fun. But opinion polls worldwide tell us that the majority of people in the majority of countries now no longer believe the future will be better than today. And they no longer believe their children will have a better life than them. And the data I present in my book shows that actually what people are intuiting is reflecting what the reality, that something is badly wrong. Unfortunately, the mainstream media in nearly every country is against this view being taken seriously. Because what's the most dangerous idea for people who have wealth and status in this society? It's the idea that the society they became successful within is actually self-destructive. Because when we realize that, then we don't have an automatic reason to respect the systems that maintain their wealth and status and power. So that's a potentially revolutionary shift in our perspective. It invites us to drop any compromise and to speak more freely about what we see and what we believe in. Unfortunately, the mainstream environmental profession isn't telling us the whole truth either. Most of people in the environmental sector have gone for the easy story that we can transition our societies off of fossil fuels without a massive reduction in the consumption of energy and resources, and therefore without a major redistribution of wealth in society to help that. So ahead of my talk today, I just released an essay on my website, uh, gembendel.com, where I claim that the environmental profession and that I've been part of for decades um, is now telling a fake green fairy tale, which is comprised of nine lies. When I'll list them briefly. The fairy tale claims that humanity can maintain current levels of consumption, a lie. By being powered by renewables, a lie. Which are already displacing fossil fuels, a lie. And therefore we can reach net zero, a lie. To bring temperatures down within just a few years to safe levels, a lie. To secure a sustainable future for all, a lie and that the enemies of this outcome are the critics of this proposed energy transition, a lie, who are all funded or influenced by the fossil fuel industry, a lie. So, the proponents of green globalist aims are, are ethical in doing whatever they want, whatever it takes to achieve their aims, another lie. So my argument is, because there's so much evidence to the contrary on that now, these aren't just misunderstandings. This is, this is a story that is maintained in quite a self-serving way, because it doesn't challenge power as we find it. And you, um, you can read about these green lies with evidence and data and references on my website. 
for the translator, I'm just going to skip ahead a couple of paragraphs. I know these self-deceptions are powerful and have consequences as they shaped my own work for decades. And going forward, I wonder how much ecological destruction in the form of new mining will be permitted and financed due to belief in this fake green fairy tale. Permits for mining in primary forests have already been issued with the explanation because of the climate crisis. For instance, the Brazilian government explained that critical minerals for a net zero economy are the reason they're issuing permits for mining in the Amazon rainforest, including in areas inhabited by indigenous peoples. Now, of course, that kind of mining is a major cause of deforestation. But the narrowness of focus of the fake green fairy tale overlooks that. It ignores the science on the role of forests in cooling our climate through cloud seeding. And that's not just a regional effect, because the pollen and bacteria rising from just the Amazon rainforest is seeding clouds all the way in, over in Tibet. In the, so we, we discover that in the snow in Tibet. But the problem is, some people are so fixated on this green fairy tale that then they miss that completely. Billionaire non-scientist Bill Gates tells us that trees don't matter for our climate. He laughs off tree protection and the planting of trees because of climate concerns. And he asked his audience last year, are we the science people or are we the idiots? Well, I'm happy your new president doesn't listen to the pseudoscience of Bill Gates and she has prioritized forest conservation in Mexico, or so she says. I hear she's committed to no new deforestation from agriculture. So it'd be great if that's part of a broader commitment to preserve forests and reforest in Mexico. And if so, maybe she could go to Davos next year and tell Bill Gates that Mexicans are the science people, unlike idiots <clears throat> like him. Of course, some people say we environmentalists should not argue amongst ourselves, but they're mistaken about who we are. I'm not in the same movement as people who will campaign for policies that will trash the Amazon rainforest for a false promise of a more electric lifestyle for elites. I'm not in the same profession or movement with people who want us to defer to systems that have caused this destruction. I'm in a very different movement today. So before concluding, I want to tell you a little bit about it. Over the past six years since I had this, this change in my perception and was public about it, I've seen evidence that the truth will set you free. Your own response to acceptance of our predicament obviously will be unique to you. But from what I've seen in people, it can be transformative because facing the reality of an unsustainable civilization that is past its peak doesn't mean giving up, doesn't mean becoming a hedonist, doesn't mean seeking retribution. Instead, it involves letting go of once, what we once assumed or we hoped for. And that means new things can emerge for us. So in the book, Cayendo Juntos, I celebrate the changes I've been witnessing in people's lives once they've accepted that our modern societies are in this slow process of collapse. Many people become full-time activists or community leaders. And of course, that debunks the idea that those people with a catastrophic outlook um, don't have a commitment to change. Many of the people I've met in this new collapse-aware community worldwide share what I describe as an eco-libertarian sentiment where we resist overbearing authority and the false promise of being saved by technology to work locally on environmental protection, adaptation, and mutual support. It's difficult. Awakening to societal collapse as an unfolding process does obviously bring with it some fear of death, of our own death and of those we love. 
And unfortunately, some people suppress that with a kind of ego defense, becoming more stubborn about their existing views. But many are experiencing it as a process in the opposite way of opening up. They realize they no longer crave to feel safe, coherent, valued, defended, and impactful. Instead, they allow themselves to be fallibly open-minded, open-hearted, forgiving, and open to experiencing life with more gratitude than the way they did before. That way they, like me, perhaps like us, we might be able to soften the disruptions ahead of us, or at least not make them worse. And in that, accidentally, we might even start something new, perhaps something both ancient and new. But that can only begin if we stop pretending and find a new freedom in truth. So uh, it's a big book. If you already agree with the analysis, you can skip the first half. Um, if you're not convinced, I wouldn't have been if I didn't study it, then um, you probably need to read the first half. So thank you for listening. Thank you. Uno, dos, tres, uno, dos, tres. And thank you, Professor Bendel, for your presentation. Thank you for shattering our hopes and dreams in 20 minutes. <laughs> So, so much to unpack from, from your presentation and particularly I would like uh, to unpack some elements that perhaps some, some people in the audience are even new uh, to understanding the kind of damage, the, uh, of environmental damage that we're facing today in the world. And now, the, uh, the audience hears that it is not only about environmental damage, but it is about collapse. So, can you please walk us through what does it mean, what does collapse mean in the first place? How is it different? Because, uh, uh, how is it different from apocalypse? How is it different from extinction? What is, what is, what do we need to understand from what collapse is? What are the different stages that this might imply? What do we need to understand from the word collapse before we all start panicking? Thank you. Hello. Okay, I'm on. It's a good question because when I first uh, realized how bad climate change is and how it has its own momentum. I used the frame of collapse, but I, I didn't realize I had this idea of a sudden, a, a sudden collapse, like a, a building at the moment where it all just falls down. I didn't realize that the power of the, the, the word collapse is about how things as they are break without being able to be put back together. So what will come next is a different system, a different way of living. So I define collapse now in a similar way to the existing scholarship in uh, where people have studied the collapse of past civilizations. So it's a process. It can take many, many years. Um, typically within one or two generations. And where, where a new social order takes a few generations to emerge. So I describe it as an uneven ending of our normal modes of sustenance, shelter, and indeed everything else. So entertainment, transportation, meaning-making, identity. So, it, so it, the, the crucial thing is a breaking. Now, 
I talk about the collapse of modern industrial consumer societies, and I have a chapter in the book where I describe what is an industrial consumer society. Now, f for the majority of humans around the world today, we don't produce what we eat and what clo we, we clothe ourselves with and we don't build our own homes. We are all consumers of mass industrially produced consumer goods. So we are therefore, our, our, our modes of sustenance and shelter and transportation are reliant on those industrial consumer systems. Those industrial consumer systems currently rely on fossil fuels, really. 80% uh, of primary energy generation in the world today is from fossil fuels. Also, our agriculture. So, we're a grain-based civilization, just a, uh, like a handful of grains. You know them, you know, corn, wheat, barley, rice. Um, there's estimates that about 60% of all the calories that we eat, either directly or through the livestock, come from those grains. And about 60% or more of the production of that depends on uh, fertilizers from natural gas. So that we're so reliant on, on the fossil fuel economy for how we eat and how we live. So yes, I'm saying that's breaking down. I'm saying it's breaking down already and I provide evidence of that and I'm just extrapolating from existing trends. But the way that we experience it includes things like rising prices because of climactic damage to agriculture. Um, it includes the, the fact that our economic systems are trying to create the impression and semblance of economic growth through financial monetary engineering when actually um, uh, we're actually, it's more expensive to get hold of energy now in terms of the amount of energy to put in to get it out. And we are bashing up against ecological limits. We're having to do more to maintain agricultural production and, and, and inputs to various industrial processes. It's a huge topic. And so, yeah, it's very difficult to summarize in a, in a short way. And I always feel a bit defeated when I try and do it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Professor. So, um, about this word collapse, with a growing literature on, on, on collapse, many, uh, many identify different uh, stages or levels of, of collapse. I'm from, I'm from your book, your, the extensive description of why you think uh, we're headed towards collapse, and these different stages how is it that you jump to the conclusion, or go to the conclusion, better said, get to the conclusion that collapse is inevitable? So I actually say it's, it's already underway because the, the foundations of the way we live are already breaking. So one would be just the if you look at the ecological footprint of the way we live, um, we, we, we overshot the, the Earth's resources on, I think it's August the 1st is the date that's been calculated for this year. Um, so if you're talking about stages, yeah, there are, there, are, there are authors and analysts who've talked about stages. So initially you'll have an economic collapse and then you'll have a legal collapse or a financial collapse and I, I haven't attempted to map things out in that way. I think the, the systems are too complex and I'm not motivated by wanting that map. I find that when people want that map, it's coming from a place of thinking that if they have a map, they will feel safer. And, and I think the desire to feel safer is not really going to help us be stay curious 
and adapt. So other people can have a go at that, but I'm, I'm, I haven't done it in the book. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm speaking about this because I think it's not only about having a map, but having like, the arguments, the evidence to get to the position to say that collapse is already happening, that it is, that it is inevitable, and that, that it is happening uh, in, in this moment. So what is, what is the evidence to make this, this statement? And uh, of course, we have uh, global reports, the IPCC, the IPBES, and many other, many other reports. Now, these reports, even though many of the messages of their key messages are very, very um, disheartening, uh, very alarming, the word collapses is not part of uh, uh, of of what of what is in their in their messages. So, uh, just to finish, just to finish this, how do we get to the point if if the scientific evidence is not pointing there? What is the IPCC is saying in the sixth assessment report, uh, working group two? is that the, lim the, uh, the opportunity to guarantee or to drive sustainable development is closing. <clears throat> so, what, what scientists who participate in the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, what they say privately is different from what makes it into the report. So privately, the majority of them think we'll hit three degrees Celsius above uh, industrial, uh, pre-industrial temperatures. So that is widely understood as, as something that our society can't cope with. Jim Skier, the um, chair, just said last week that uh, he thinks we're headed for three degrees. So they're all now sort of, and that's, so that's public. <laughs> so they are, they are saying this without using like, and therefore uh, we're going to break down. Um, and yet, there are warnings about societal collapse in some of these reports. Uh, the UN Disaster Risk Reduction Agency talks about this, and the IPCC is going to be looking at um, so-called ex uh, existential risks from from sort of the, the more um, concerning runaway models. So there's been a, there's been a, a radicalizing of the scientific message slowly. That's on climate then. But in 90% of countries, on all populated continents, the Human Development Index, which is the main indices worldwide since, I think, 1990, um, it's been going down. So the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, it's not that we're not reaching them, it's that in so many of them, we're going backwards. So what I'm saying is we now have evidence since around 2016, because obviously also some of the data that goes into these indices is in some areas is two years old, we have evidence of a consistent decline in a range of things like chronic disease, malnutrition. Um, and it's, so it's, it's consistent and it's global. And it's being ignored because it doesn't fit within the narrative that we can improve the world by bringing more and more people into a sustainable consumer economy. Um, so why, we, we, we know why, we know why, I, I mean, I said it, this is a very challenging conclusion to speak publicly. Um, and so most people don't say it publicly, even if they work on it. Um, I think your question was how to get people to talk about collapse uh, at those levels. 
the, the main point here was if collapse was an opinion or a consensus or scientific consensus. Oh, I see. Okay, so <clears throat> publicly there is no scientific consensus that the collapse of industrial consumer societies is currently occurring. There are hundreds of scholars around the world who've publicly declared that it is. So you can go to scholarswarning.net and you will see them. They, they're out there public about it. And you have reputable institutions like MIT published just recently on their blog an article that collapse is coming. You've got lots of people trying to work out how are they going to work on it. Um, but yeah, no, there's, there's active censorship against this. Like I was interviewed by NPR. They sent over one of their national public radio in the States. They sent over one of their best, uh, most experienced journalists. And she interviewed me in the UK for nine hours. And we did all the fact checking. And then just the week before broadcast on NPR, it was canceled with her manager, the editor, saying, oh, we can't put that out. So there's this, there's a managerial class who thinks that it's the, we can't cope with this truth. They think we will all go crazy and start killing each other. Are they, but actually these are ideas that are self-serving to keep everything calm for themselves. Great, I, I mean so many questions that I would like to give uh, also a space for, for the public, but I would like only uh, to transition to the questions, something that I would like for you to speak to, to our audience. Based on the responsibility to speak about this kind of alarming topics and to raise the issue on the minds of people who suddenly become very aware of, of the kind of problems that we're facing. So what do you think is the responsibility, I mean for you, for me also as a climate scientist, for the scientific community who understands, who have these public mess at t moments, who can speak to the public, what do you think is the, our responsibility, your responsibility here with the people who hear you? There's... I've, I've met quite a lot of people who think as experts, intellectuals, academics that they should be very cautious about what they say to the public on these issues. And six years ago when my paper Deep Adaptation went viral, I didn't really want to talk through mass media to a mass public audience about these things. I focused on how to help people who came to this view and conclusion themselves and connect them so they could talk to each other, process difficult emotions, help them, people change. And so that was a big focus. But as I said in my talk, opinion polls now show that the majority of people in the majority of countries believe that things are going in the wrong direction. And they don't think it's going to get fixed. And that public uh, discussion is suppressed on this. What that leads to is suppressed anxiety. And psychologists tell us if we suppress anxiety, then it means that it will, be, it will come out in certain maladaptive ways we will become more racist, we will become more xenophobic, we will become more homophobic, we will, be, we will start hating people who don't have our religion. We, we, this, this, and guess what? While mainstream media doesn't talk about this, opportunistic YouTubers do. They say it's breaking down because we're not God-fearing enough, or it's breaking down because the border's letting too many foreigners in, or we're breaking down because there's too many transgendered people. They're just making up stuff. They're ignoring the fact this is a global phenomenon and, and instead coming up with whatever suits their ideology. 
and says that's to blame. So if we don't talk about it, and yet people are intuiting this for themselves, then we're actually providing the conditions for greater polarization and hatred in society. So it's the opposite. You know, when people say, oh, well, I think I, as a professor, I think I know this, but I don't want to talk about it because I'm scared everyone will go a bit mad. No, by you not talking about it and people suppressing the anxieties, you're allowing these very bizarre responses to emerge. Thank you so much, Professor. A round of applause for the professor, please. Perhaps we can take a, a couple of questions from, from, from the audience. Yes. Um, do you have... Uh, Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if not, I can choose. Thank you very much, Luis. Thank you very much, Jim. I know you a few minutes ago. How to break together with my students, because I can't do it. Um, it's very difficult because I, every day I give, I give uh, climate change, ethics, and my students, I don't know if, if they don't want to hear that, or they hear different things. And it's like I, I am in a world very difficult because I am telling, them that we are falling down, that, that there are very few possibilities uh, for us to continue, uh, like a species, and with the other species. And I have read the IPCC, and I invite them, and I think some of them are here because I invite them, uh, but I don't know how to do it every day, to falling down together. How do you have a suggestion for me or for academic uh, uh, professors? Thank you very much. Thank you. Are they university students or high school? University. Yeah, yeah, undergrad. Uh, so the first thing is undergraduates are adults, so drop any silly ideas about protecting them, because <laughs> I even hear that from some professors that we should protect students. You're talking about 18, 19 year olds, come on. So, but it sounds like you're not wanting to protect them, you're wanting to bring the truth as you see it. I, I suppose what's more important than your students agreeing with someone like me is your students having the critical capacities to analyze whether I'm an idiot or not. So you can present it like that. This guy is saying this, this, and these people are saying that. And helping, helping your students work it out for themselves. I would disagree with a teaching method which says IPCC is the authority and therefore this is like a sacrosanct because there are processes in professions and in institutionalized science which therefore produce the consensus, which doesn't mean it's the most accurate view. The IPCC has tried to find consensus amongst a huge volume of information. That doesn't necessarily mean they looked at the most salient information. In 2017, two, two climate scientists who specialize in analyzing the Pacific Ocean published a paper that said, by studying Pacific, we quite easily could see 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial by 2025. The IPCC was still saying back then that if we halve carbon emissions by 2030, we've got a 50% chance of avoiding 1.5 by 2050. So the IPCC has been a joke proven today with current measurements right now. It's not theory, right now shows that there's stuff from 2017, 20, it was a joke. So they need to look at why that happened. So, so I think it would be more interesting, me as a student, 
be more interested. Like, okay, this is the IPCC. This is some crazy guy called Jen Bendel from 2018. This is some YouTuber who says it's all a hoax and they're trying to manipulate the weather to make us scared so they'll lock us away in our houses. You present it all and get everyone to talk about it and it'll be fun. Hi. How do you de deal with the emotions when you recognize all the suffering that's coming? How do I deal with my emotions when I recognize all the suffering that's coming? So it's changed over time. Initially, uh, there was, I felt a lot more pain. And uh, grief and fear on my own and in groups of people who shared this perspective. And being in groups of people actually helped to go deeper into the feelings of grief. Um, but it would also somehow lessen the feeling of fear. Fear was very much my own private thing. I would sometimes feel some panic. Now, I don't quite feel the same way anymore. I, I'm more just accepting that I'm going to die and I don't know when. At any moment, my ability to pay for something with my credit card might stop. There might be World War III next week. I, I've somehow lost the, the panic. I do wonder if it's because I've become numb or, be, or if I'm just more okay with knowing that everything's fragile and I'm very lucky to be enjoying this moment right now. It could be both. Um, the grief, the grief is, is very much like losing a relative or a loved cat. It, even though it's grief for the future as well, it becomes more of a, a part of everyday life, but it doesn't dominate you. It's just sort of there, this gray, dull, heavy thing. But also you can look at it and think, it's only because I love it's only because I had, had so much joy and I, admi I love life so much that the loss of it is this sort of grey heaviness. Um, so, yeah, but I, people do describe that so quite a lot, there's quite a lot of grief counsellors who work in the deep adaptation movement precisely because of this. Like, how do we live with grief and have a great life while living with grief as well? Not forgetting grief, but knowing it's always there. Um, this is a moment when I'd love to hear from you and other people. How do you live with these difficult emotions? I mean, I don't necessarily have the answers at all. Hi, um, thank you very much. I would love to oh, hear from... Uh, so, yes, but if we have one more question, then a young person maybe at university or high school. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, do you have kids, Jim? Do you have kids of your own? Can, is that the, is that, I, I'd like a full question. Oh, okay. My son is sitting uh, here with me and um, I also teach, like my colleague back here, uh, young 20-year-old college students. Um, and I'm, I'm very much impressed by the evolution uh, you describe in your own process, right? Uh, how, to, how to face with uh, freedom-loving and, and compassionate attitude towards, well, in, in, in fact, it seems to be towards life. Um, isn't it not, not just the collapse, but towards life right now? Collapse or no collapse, whatever may come, right? It, it, that's what I'm, what I'm catching from you. Um, so my question about do you have kids is, you know, 
how do you feel about our future? I mean, not just in terms of projecting a collapse, but you know, as a loving person and the possibility of a loving person to continue to be around and to experience uh, the wonder of human life later on, you know, in, in I don't know, 50 years or whatever, <clears throat> right? So I'd like to have a go at responding to what I hear as, as the substance of your question, and, and I may have got it wrong, but... Uh, when I first thought that, oh dear, there's going to be mass death, billions of humans dying younger than what we might expect now of, you know, 77 years or whatever, um, I then thought, wow, that's awful that children being born today are likely to have a shorter lifespan than the average person of my, I'm 51, my, my age. And then from my balcony, I saw these two sisters running through the fields chasing butterflies. And I thought, if they die when they're 40, rather than when they're 70, that doesn't make their lives any less amazing, any less beautiful. And it's the stories I have from my culture that longevity is somehow the most important thing, that um, is, it's one of the things I'm losing from, from adjusting to this new view of the future, that there might be great difficulty people dying because there's le lack of access to medicine or because there's war or because of malnutrition. So, um, but it's a very difficult decision. I know a lot of people who find it very difficult whether to have a child or not, knowing, having concluded what I've concluded, or at least a part of what I've concluded. Um, and some of them do. Um, yeah. I've gone through different periods for years when I thought I can't have a child because of how I see the future and times when I decided no I would and then nature intervened uh, to not make that possible. Is it possible for, to hear from From, from we don't have students. any, any time. The, the book for, do you want to listen to the students? Well, just hear the, hear the question then, and okay. I don't answer it, because I haven't got time, but at least I'll hear the question. Okay, <laughs> just say the, the question, please. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Wendell. I am studying sustainable development engineering because I want to do my part and convince people to act. But I get really frustrated because I feel like there is no hope anymore, or it's too hard. What could you say young people like me or people like here in this room to, to just don't lose hope? What could you say to us? Thank you. Let, let's listen to the, another question that you have your hand up for a lot of time. Yeah. Come on. The, maybe we can, we can listen to the, the questions and maybe just give. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, but at the boat, and you can answer both questions. <laughs> yes. Uh, Come on, thank say Thank you so question. much for your time. My question is, uh, what type of initiatives have you seen around the world which you think Latin America countries can kind of copy in order to change the system in a more practical, positive way? Thank you for your... your both of your questions. So, any story about the future, I believe now, um, can't be believed. And so we have to find a deeper motivation where we're not pretending to ourselves. A deeper motivation for doing what's right, what feels right uh, to you. So it's different for everybody. 
But if regenerating nature, protecting forests, reducing carbon emissions feels right, it feels good, it feels sane, um, and talking to other people about doing that and trying to live differently, not as a, just a mass consumer, if that feels right to you now and gives you joy and a sense of wholeness and integrity in yourself now, then do it. And anyone who says that I'm doing it because we're going to achieve X and we're going to get to net zero and then we're going to save the world, um, what happens when for the rest of their life and your life, everything gets worse? Because that's what's going to happen. In my life, I've worked since 1995 on sustainability. Every single year, biodiversity's got worse. Carbon emissions, climate change got worse every single year since 1995. And it's going to get worse for the, every single year for the rest of my life. And I'm still going to keep trying as hard as I can to do as much as good possible. So it doesn't matter if things get worse, because I've got a deeper foundation for doing what I do. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I run an organic farm school in Indonesia. We're teaching the... It's, it's, it's ridiculous. There's no one teaching organic farming to Indonesian agricultural students in Bali, apart from me, who just showed up and 18 months ago opened a, a regenerative farming school. It's ridiculous. So we've now got partnerships with the universities to, for them to send. They want to send 200 students to us. And we're a tiny, tiny little farm, 3,000 square meters, just running with me funding it. So there's massive opportunities to expand and roll out regenerative education, in this case, farming in Indonesia. But so much that could be done. We don't tell people this is how you save the world. We don't know how bad it's going to become, how fast. You know, my farm could be washed away in a flood. But at least I'm doing something really good right now. So I've, be, I've got to that point. Do something really good right now, and we don't know what's, how bad it's going to get. <laughs>